Hi everybody, welcome back. I'm returning to these online videos after a bit of a hiatus. Uh, I taught the first semester of Greek in the fall of 2012 at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. Uh, I didn't take this teach the second semester until this last term, spring of 2014, and it's been a busy time of year for me as a kind of junior scholar. I have a lot of obligations of publishing and uh, service to the university, so I didn't actually get around to recording videos, but now I'm wrapping up the, the end of Shalmerdine's uh, Introduction to Greek Second Edition, uh, so I'm only going to have chapters 30 through 34 in this next kind of installment of the online series. I'm looking forward to getting back and backfilling uh, chapters 17 through 29, uh, but those will have to wait for another day. Uh, but hopefully this is getting out in time for some of you at an in institution that's using Shalmerdine uh, and going later on into the spring, into the early summer with your courses. Uh, maybe this will be a perfect timed for you all. So here we are, chapter 30, talking about the indefinite relative pronoun. So we've talked about the relative pronoun uh, before, but I want to start off before we get into, and indefinite for that matter, so we're, we're, we've covered both of these. Uh, but I want to start with an English example to illustrate this before we really move into the Greek. Uh, so I'm going to I know I've gotten comments on YouTube about my bad handwriting. I'm sorry, I have a very small tablet. Uh, this is an inexpensive operation, if that wasn't already clear. Uh, but let me start typing as if the, this were a typewriter. And I'm addressing a general form letter. Uh, perhaps I'm writing a letter of recommendation. So I'm going to write something to the effect of, to whomever it may concern. And then that's going to be you know, the address level of the email and then I can continue on dot 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 we'll see where things go but let's let's look at this to whomever it may concern and we can now think about start thinking about this in kind of grammatical terms familiar from our study of Greek so to whomever we're gonna see that's somewhat of a dative relationship right uh, it's going directed to somebody this is an indirect object we've seen this before so to whomever it may concern it here, uh, this is going to be an impersonal usage. We're not attaching it to this thing, or this letter. I mean, that's really c kind of what we're talking about. But this is impersonal it. This is a dummy verb or dummy, dummy subject. Uh, may is going to be our main verb, which takes um, a kind of um, supplementary verbal notion. So it may concern it, you know, to whomever it may not concern. We could, we could work with that. but. Let's now think about this. So this is our impersonal subject. It's a dummy, it's a filler, because really what we've got here is an impersonal verb, may concern. And this is going to take normally an indirect object, which is exactly what we have here. But now let's think about the difference between what it would mean to say to whom it may concern and to whomever. What is that difference? Well, to whom is our relative pronoun, things that we've been seeing for a while now. So if we were going to do this in Greek, masculine, again, we're going to just default to that, however chauvinistic that may be, ho, to whomever, dative, masculine, because we're just defaulting to that, um, and then singular, because ultimately we're, we're thinking that this will affect one person, it will concern one person, um, so we're going to say to whom. Right, uh, I mean, even your high school English grammar will, you know, potentially, if it's worth its salt, will we'll be telling you, yes, you need to include this. We need the object case in English. You can't just say to who it may concern, to whom it may concern. But now let's let's go back, erase my little ineffective scribble out, and think about the difference between to whom and to whomever. Well, whomever is saying we don't know exactly who this concerns. We know it's going to concern one person. We know it's singular. Um, but we don't know precisely who. It might be this person in uh, one circumstance, it might be another person in another circumstance. So this is where we get the indefinite aspect from. So whom and ever. And note that in English, what we've just done is we've tacked on this word ever to the end of our relative pronoun, whom, to whom it may concern, to whomever it may concern. This is exactly the process that we're going to see in the Greek indefinite relative pronouns. And these are, again, chapter 30, section 1, uh, and uh, the second edition of Shelmerdine. This takes us to page 207. So let me scroll down to a, a bit of a chart I was beginning to draw, uh, and we can start filling things in. 
So just on that analogy of whoever, which is what we'd be looking in for the nominative, we'll want our relative pronoun for who, hos, and then now we want to put in that ever, that indefinite aspect that we had seen from a couple chapters ago with the word tis. So it was tis in the masculine or feminine and t in the neuter. So why at that point when we were learning tis, tinos, tini, tina, um, why did we only have two columns? We had a masculine and feminine versus now we have a complete neuter uh, and a complete neuter. Now we've got a, a separate feminine. Well, that's all has to do with the relative pronoun here because we have a different word for he who and she who, hey, right? And remember the way that we could tell that tis was indefinite was that it was enclitic, it had no accent. So this is exactly what we have going on here. We have hostis, hey, tis, ha, ti, whoever, masculine, whoever, feminine, whatever, neuter. So that's all great, but then just as English combines whoever into one word, Greek does the same thing. So I've put a space here, but that's really, that's not what we're going to be looking at in Greek. We're going to be looking at hostis, but what have I done wrong here? Well, now that the sigma is no longer at the end of the word, we're going to need to make that one of the standard earlier sigmas, not a, not a word final sigma as we have here. Hatis, there's not that problem, so we can just move that a little bit closer. Now, haughty, you can see where there might be a problem if we write it like this, because, you know, whatever looks a lot like, you know, the kind of conjunction that we were using for indirect statement. Lego, haughty, I say that. So in order to distinguish between these things, Greek is standardly written where hostis and hatis in the nominative will be one word. Hot, but they will be accented as if they're two. Because again, this is enclitic, so it's just, you know, we've basically removed the space. This space is maintained, let me draw a little underscore there, in the neuter only for the purpose of, you know, disambiguating haughty as one word, what or that, from ha, ti, whatever. So now as we go down the columns, uh, we're just going to conjugate both. Because remember, these are two, or sorry, not conjugate. We're not talking verbs. We're talking nouns, decline. Uh, nouns are adjectives or pronouns. We'll get into the pronoun adjectival distinction here soon. So we have hostis, hatis, haughty. So now how, what did hos become in the genitive masculine singular relative? Well, that was who. And then tis became tinos. So who, tinos, one word, that's it. Now also remember that we had tinos as one option. Another option was the standard second declension, two. So we really have two here. Ha, who, tinos, or who, two, either or. Um, no, no Tootsie reference here, this isn't Rwanda. All right, feminine, hatis, so who, tinos. Now we'd want what, hais, tinos. And again, here we won't have the second declension form because we're in the feminine. We're going to keep third. But again, we've got the problem of this isn't a word final sigma anymore. Uh, so we're going to just want to change that writing. Now, I think some of you who are, you know, kind of tuned into ideas about Greek epigraphy, uh, writing on stone and things, are going to say, you know, Al, this is stupid because in either event, no matter whether you have words separate or not, uh, uh, sorry, that, that's a backwards and that's the, looking rather Cyrillic. Um, this is what you'd be seeing on the stone, heis tinos, no matter what, or even haughty, you'd be getting haughty, one word, all capitals, no space, no matter what. This is true. These are later uh, standardizations of the form. We, we, we call that orthography, Greek uh, for correct writing. So these things are subjective, they're cultural. There's no objective, correct way to do this. Uh, but we need standards, we need uh, the sign system to be universal uh, within a language speaking culture. So not, not broadly universal, but we need people to be able to read the same thing correctly. So that's why we have orthography. So that's why these things are combined versus haughty. 
there's no good reason for it. I mean, there are practical reasons, but that doesn't, we've seen that Greek isn't always ruled by practical rules. Uh, these are just the standards and we, we sadly have to accept them, but that's fine. So who tenos, who tu, heis tenos, and now in the neuter, we're gonna get the same thing as the masculine. Who tenos, and the accent will be there, or again, who tu because the second declension works for both masculine and neuter here. Data, you'll know where this is going because we already talked about it. Who, to whom, um, and then data of, of tinos, tini. Uh, we also got that also other option of what's going to show up as hoto. We're gonna talk just briefly about this in a moment, but we can at least write this all out and note that this is a strange looking accent to have a circumflex on the anti penult but that's because this is this word as a dative relative was accented that way and this is enclitic don't confuse this for regular word formation in greek these are two words that have had the space removed so that's how we can get hoteni why don't we have hoto well, when I write it out like that, you might start to kind of realize why we might not do it that way. These things are too similar. So we've got something, a linguistic process here called dissimilation, becoming unsimilar. Uh, it helps with pronunciation, so you're not going hoto, um, uh, and it's clear kind of on analogy with hoti and these other things that we're seeing that this is a dative indefinite. So that's that's a kind of strange form. Uh, note that these are alternates. These are different options we can do. And then again, just to save some time, this this is going to replay identically here in the neuter. So we're going to have hoteni and then hoto right there. And again, note that here we're getting dissimilation in the second form. All right, now feminine, again, we're going to only have one form, and this is going to be just as we'd expect it to be. Hey, again with the circumflex accent, and then tinny. Good. All right, so we're making progress. Let's get into the accusative. Uh, so accusative of masculine singular relative, hon, and then tina, on tina, that's easy. No alternate there. Uh, same thing in first declension here, hain, tina, first declension for the relative, third declension is all, always for the indefinite, hain, tina, to, uh, as direct object, she, whomever, uh, and then again, always in the neuter that the accusative is identical to the nominative, hoti. So we can see this is our singular chart. Hostis, hetis, hoti, hu tenos or hutu, heis tenos, hu tenos, hutu, hoteni, hoto, heteni, hoteni, hoto, hontena, hentena, hoti. All right, great, let's go plural now. So this is our plural chart again. Apologies for the handwriting, nothing I can do about it at this point. Uh, at least I'm, I'm a doctor, I'm not a medical doctor, so it's, it's better than that. So hoi, going to be our relative plural nominative masculine. Uh, and then tines, again, great third declension. No, no weirdy forms here. Um, although, also, you can get high tines, and you're gonna revolt against that because that looks awfully feminine, but this is just something that can happen. Hoi tines or high tines. Now when we get to the feminine, so maybe I should draw these lines to make these things clear, uh, we've got ha tina, okay, and that's going to look fairly neuter, but then the neuter actually has a totally different form, hata. So this, this should frustrate you. I have nothing to say, but I'm sorry. Uh, but you've been frustrated before in Greek and you've made it to chapter 30, so I'm gonna assume you have tolerance and keep moving. So hon tenon, this is going to be a bit more appropriate. We know what's going to happen there. And then again, on the same principle of dissimilation, we don't want too many of these long omegas, you'll also see hot tone. Uh, but we don't get that in the uh, feminine again, we don't have these alternative forms there, so we'll just have ha ten on simply, uh, and then the neuter will replay the exact same thing as the masculine, which we're used to in the genitive um, plural neuters. So either hon, hon ten on or ha tone. By the time we get to the dative, uh, we'll have our kind of standard form hoist, 
hoistissi, sorry, jumped ahead of myself, hoistissi, and then again that's got a new movable at the end, uh, or the kind of standard alternative form, hotois, um, heis tissi or tissin here in the feminine, and then the dative is going to be identical to the masculine once again, so hois tissi with an optional move, new movable, or just hotois. And then finally, last but not least, the accusative plural, hus, again, that's probably expected at this point, hus tenas, note that that's a short alpha, uh, that's because we're working in the third declension, or again, we get this alpha form, has tenas, again, that will be a short alpha. Uh, you don't really need to worry about these quantities, these lengths of these alphas, but it will become useful when you get into poetry. However, you don't see the indefinite relative pronoun that frequently in poetry. Still, nice things to know. Why not take an extra couple seconds and learn them as we're learning them? So hata, again, of course, is going to be identical to the nominative because we're in the neuter. And then hatena, we get the same thing going on in the feminine here. Again, this should frustrate you. And again, I, I got nothing but apologies. So let's quickly recap before we move on. I know this has turned into a long video lesson already. This is the indefinite relative pronoun or adjective. When is it an adjective? Well, when it's used next to a noun. To whatever man it may concern. To whatever general it may concern. A uh, pronoun is taking the place of a noun. This is our indirect object, to whomever. But then if it's modifying to whomever... Um, general. We would say whatever general because we would turn this neuter in English, grammatically neuter. Uh, but they'll, they'll use all genders for this adjectival form. So all that you need to do to have an adjective is you also have a noun that it modifies. So I'll say plus modified noun. Otherwise it's going to just act as a pronoun on its own. So here we had our declension. In the singular, it wasn't too bad, and your standardized form on the left is almost always going to just be your standard relative pronoun plus your standard indefinite adjective or indefinite pronoun ending combined. Haughty keeps the space to separate it from haughty, the conjunction, so we, we wanted to disambiguate those. Here we have everything else that we might expect. It's not too bad. We have these alternate forms, uh, but those are fairly easy. They're working on the second declension model uh, rather than second combined with third, uh, and they dissimilate where needed. Plural, this gets messy when we have these different forms of the masculine nominative uh, and that should be frustrating because that, that, for all intents and purposes, looks like the feminines we've been working with up here, but it's not. The feminine has its own form. So th this takes some getting used to, but again, if it's an adjective uh, and you have heitenes next to a masculine noun like strategoi, uh, to, you know, whatever generals were leading the soldiers, they were good or something like that, we could use heitenes next to strategoi and this would not be a problem. This would not be hard for you to keep track of. Uh, but these, these forms look like they might be neuter, where the neuter forms look completely different. This is something that should frustrate you. Uh, but just learn it, uh, and it will be easy for the most part to actually recognize in practice. So we'll move on to that in a future lesson where we actually tackle some of the problem sets from this lesson. Uh, hope this was helpful. See you next time.